aim of uh, the aim of the study is to optimize the energy utilization and minimize the carbon emissions for low carbon society. Uh, my model uh, is Asia Pacific Integrated Model in and use. Uh, I am working on the passenger travel and the freight travel for the road transport in the Bhopal city. I have collected the data and uh, demand. Uh, I have predicted the demand for the 2040 and I have provided the share and it will give the output uh, of the technology mix emissions and uh, sectoral energy consumption. This is the structure of the aim and use model. Uh, first is energy and technology and the services. The options of an energy are uh, oil, gas, natural gas, etc. The technologies are vehicle, two wheeler, three wheeler, four wheeler, etc. The services are passenger transport, uh, freight transport in the transport sector. For this set of services, we have the service demand. And for this service demand, we have the technology options. And for this technology options, we have the energy consumption options and the subsequent CO2 emissions. For this service demand, the drivers are the population, growth, income level increases, economic growth, lifestyle changes, etc. And for this technology selection, these two criteria are based energy type, technology prices, energy prices and the lifestyle of the uh, life of the technology, <coughs> emission factors in uh, energy consumption, capacity, etc. This is how my model uh, in and use looks like. This is an Excel based model. There are various sheets uh, in which we have to feed the data. This is the other uh, uh, form to represent the model. We have specific energy, devices and services. We have service demand. We have to uh, feed in the model. Then for this energy demand, we have the number of devices, number of technology choices available for us. Then we have subsequent energy consumption for this and the CO2 emissions. We can apply some removal processes on the technology. On the devices, we have to apply the removal processes. And with that, we can see that how CO2, SO2, and SOX and NOX are emitted. This is the basic structure of the model. After implementing, <coughs> we have to uh, provide the service for service demand. We have to apply some operating rate. That how, at what efficiency the uh, device is working? Service losses, number of devices, the share of the devices in the future year, uh, the various countermeasures at an user's stage, the carbon and the emission taxes, and the subsidies to the renewable technologies. This is my RES, reference energy system. Uh, that side is the energy, the uh, technology choices, and these are the services. I have, pro uh, I have uh, projected the two scenarios, PM1, countermeasure 1, countermeasure 2, along with the business as usual scenario. In the business as usual scenario, the present trend of the energy consumption, demographic changes, and the coalition measures are considered to be the continuing as uh, same. <coughs> In CM1 scenario, the new technologies are introduced, like the RTS, electrical two wheelers, four wheeler. In this scenario, uh, the emission taxes are introduced, and the discount rates remains the same. Energy taxes are not introduced in the CM1 scenario. In CM2 scenario, the new technologies are introduced with the limitations of maximum share to the renewable. In this scenario, high uh, taxes on the emissions and the energy taxes are introduced. In 2010, that is my base year, the share of the two wheeler is 46 percent. Uh, uh, in if we uh, move on, uh, as a business as usual scenario, the share of the two wheeler will increase to the 30 percent, uh, will decrease to the 30 percent. But if we apply some constraint on that, so you can see that the uh, two wheeler uh, share will decrease, and the share of the car will also decrease. Whereas the buses, the RTS, uh, and public transport has increased. Uh, this shows the 
energy wise consumption fuel wise uh, consumption of the uh, fuel fuel wise uh, consumption of the energy in transport sector in the different scenarios in uh, energy consumption in the business as usual uh, we can re uh, if we apply counter measures scenario 2 then we can reduce the energy consumption by 32.5 percent whereas emission can be reduced to 33.5 percent in CM1 and 42.5 percent in CM2 scenario. The transport sector of the Bhopal demonstrate that significant emission mitigations can be achieved in the uh, low carbon scenario compared to the business and individual scenario. Policy interventions helps in mitigating the emissions by fuel substitution. The percentage share of the transport helps in uh, reducing the demand of the road and reducing the traffic emissions. These are my answers. Thank you. Parikh, Dr. Jyoti Parikh. Yeah. Right, right. We have no. Crick Parikh. Crick Parikh. Yeah. 
have the data, but uh, how can we calculate the 2009 as a base year? We can uh, select the 2000, 2010. Uh, the numbers will be like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, he asked the basis of why, based on, on what basis you chose 2010. Why not 2009? Or why not 2005? I don't know any ready made answer. Like, go back to the your drawing table. No, I have available data with me that are all the. Okay, I have all the data. But, yadi ha, 1951, ham yadi, base yadi, consider karte. So, our study will not give so much correct results what we have. Yeah, the number of vehicles are very less. Yeah, vehicle yeah. multiplication, maybe you can see yeah. the recent years. Yeah. So we can see that uh, the number of vehicles are changing very frequently from 2000. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. 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 Uh, single city and a multiple cities or a multiple countries can be uh, this model can be applied. It is an energy based model. I, I was going to suggest too, a first city like Mumbai, uh -huh. uh, what's been attempted in other cities around the world is what's called congestion pricing. Yeah. Yeah. London is the best example. Yeah. Uh, this would actually be very interesting, right? Congestion pricing uh, targeted the single occupancy vehicles. So your, your taxis, auto rickshaws, yes. buses okay. are, are exempted. Yeah. Uh, you, you essentially disincentivize those people from the suburbs driving in their yeah. single vehicles. Or if they choose to use their wealth to drive in anyway and pay their congestion fee, you use the funds to improve bus systems and, and so on. Oh, you just start in Mono, so you have a better network of Mono. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 there is any value also the people who are in the all the best, best buses are now seen in the... Yeah, yeah, all, all the buses are seen. Yeah. What you said is the population. That the development and situation that doesn't go back.
and you know is made between five percent. Uh, we have four state-owned uh, coal-based coal power plants, uh, one central-owned NTPC power plant and private, they are new, upcoming private power plants, so still now set up is uh, number two power plants have been set up. Hydro, we have small, uh, a large hydro power plant, but uh, small size hydro power plant, nearly 150 to 200 megawatt of state-owned and a uh, large, very large hydro power plant is by central government, that is uh, in NHPC one, Indra Sagar, Pranta Ratio, and till now we don't have any private own hydrogen power plants. Well, uh, the rule is if you say that state government owns two power plants and central doesn't have till now dictated there is no central based renewable power plants. And private sector is going going a bit higher in renewable based power plants. Okay, I am working in a very spot bill, which is a bottom up model, and it uh, aim is which is Asia Pacific integrated model. I, this main model and its aim and is a, a part of that model in which I am working. It focuses on technology selection of, uh, criteria uh, for the energy consumption and as well as energy production. And the selection of technology pay, uh, takes place in the linear optimization framework, that is, which technology is very much uh, low cost, which style is very suitable for the environment side. System cost is minimized by effects and constraints. Okay, this is the aim and structure. In this, uh, the energies like coal, you know, natural gas, gasoline, wind, hydro, etc., are being taken. Okay, and then uh, energy technologies are power generation technologies like so, uh, coal based power plant, hydro based power plant, up, um, gas based power plant, nuclear power plants. These are the uh, concerned energy technologies which is help in production of electricity. Okay, the electricity is the service demand. For us, we need electricity for our livelihoods, for our living. For service, so this is service, this electricity, for that we use the technology selection options. And in that, from that technology selection options, we need, we have to get the emissions, we get to see uh, energy consumption patterns. Okay, take for technology selection for, uh, criteria, we will take the energy type, energy prices, several constructing, emission factors, technology prices, like uh, lifetime of technologies, energy consumption capacities, etc. And the service demand has been calculated with the help of the population growth, income level rise, economic growth, lifestyle of and different and various parameters. Okay, I have taken a time span of 30 years and the technology selection was used for uh, using primary fuel fuels like fossil fuel, hydro, renewable, which are the primary fuels have been taken. My reference here is 2005 and I have simulated it is 2035. Uh, I have taken two scenarios, that is business as usual scenario and low uh, carbon society scenario. These two scenarios uh, depend on the development path human society uh, choose. With, and this is in the terms of economic, agricultural and technological. Okay, in business as usual scenario, um, the assumption which I have taken is that the GDP growth rate is 5%. I have taken no emission taxes in that uh, uh, business as usual scenario. Population growth is rate is 20% And electricity service demand is increasing <coughs> approximately 10 times for the next 30 years. For that, I, for a low power scenario, I have taken GDP growth rate of 8%. Emission taxes I have introduced after 2010. Because still in 2010, we haven't had, had any emission taxes still registered. So, I have taken that emission tax of 2500 per tons of carbon. And subsidies were implemented for the efficient clean and renewable technologies and low energy taxes were also introduced. Okay, the baseline scenario was that because at that time, coal was nearly 66% and hydrocarbon was 32% and renewable was only 2% until 2005. If we implement in this base asset scenario and look up to 735, uh, with no emission taxes and with emission taxes, with uh, low uh, GDP growth rate, with high GDP growth rate, we see that the uh, coal based power plant will be increasing 61%, hydro will increase 10%, and my technology selection for, uh, will be uh, more from renewable renewables. Nuclear and gas, it's not clear that, is, will be uh, having less percentage. 
displaced by the renewables and coal fossil will be less and the hydro and nuclear will be increasing uh, with this. Uh, sorry for interruption, uh -huh. you said the coal, uh -huh. your color changed. Uh -huh. Actually, my graph changed. Some, some no, problem. there you say, uh, oh, here you have given so different sets for the coal. Uh -huh. Actually, that's some kind of a problem, I think. Okay. Otherwise, uh -huh. I was thinking that you were saying that this coal will be carbon free. No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> sorry for that. Disasters, as we know, uh, imply major harms and losses to those who are exposed to them. 
But along with that, they also provide uh, windows of opportunity, opportunities for change, uh, facilitating the building of more resilient uh, communities. And why I'm talking about uh, this is because generally policy change in uh, political systems is often plagued by uh, stasis. And in most democracies, policy making uh, becomes an incremental process with sort of series of small steps uh, adding up to build on the existing policy. However, when a crisis occurs, it sort of uh, you know breaks the entire status quo, and uh, you know it, you know it sort of acts as a catalyst to trigger responses that challenge, uh, that criticizes, analyzes, uh, or reassess the existing policy. Uh, now, my paper um, is an attempt. So my paper uh, is an attempt to look uh, into the role of uh, oil spill crisis in formulating debates and uh, bringing an overall ch you know, change in the American energy system. Uh, now US environmental policy, environmental policy in the last few years has sort of become a composite, a composite of contributions and inputs from elected representatives, uh, from appointed officials, uh, you know, government, political parties, organized interest groups, mass media, Public opinion. So everybody has sort of uh, you know worked together to uh, you know bring significant changes in the you know in the policy making, and the result has been uh, new pollution laws, uh, offshore drilling restrictions, financial reforms, efficiency measures, and you know all these things. Yet, despite these successes, uh, contradictory impulses such as need for low oil prices, uh, securing inexpensive oil from outside. Uh, from debates ranging from national security to energy inter, you know, independence have sort of rendered a development of effective energy policies and practices you know, sort of ineffective. And uh, you know, the argument prevails that sort of every country, uh, and America since I'm talking about here, needs oil to fuel cars and trains and planes and you know, heating homes and it is essential, energy is essential to national security and economic uh, well-being. Which are these are the fair enough excuses to sort of minimize or assume away the risks, and the only policy then followed is to sort of encourage oil and gas uh, development. And thus, uh, we've seen at several uh, points that the government, at several at federal, at state, at local level, has it sort of remains underprepared to uh, you know handle the disasters as such. Uh, now, 2010 Deepwater Horizon also produced clarion calls for change in the entire, you know, in U.S. energy policies and environmental laws and policies. And changes were made, uh, you know, a debate took place. Yet, we saw that the basic policy uh, remain, you know, was <coughs> altered. And aggressive oil and gas development continues uh, today and it has resumed and continues. And the fundamental regulatory framework remains in place as it was. And uh, to understand the reasons behind uh, the lessons that have been learned and unlearned, it is important to sort of follow, uh, you know, U.S. policy responses, the earlier policy responses in the wake of uh, other oil spills, and sort of then come to uh, the recent one. Now, energy policies. Uh, now, oil spills, uh, if I you know explain, are sort of considered a low probability uh, events and a high consequence event, according you know accordingly. So debate suffers from uh, the entire politics of risk, where not much attention is paid before uh, you know a disaster like this, an oil spill disaster occurs. And once it occurs, then it's sort of the entire nation and everybody is in a in a very you know frizzy mode, and then you know uh, then, then there are uh, calls to change, and you know there is some sort of overreaction to the entire thing. Uh, on the other hand, since they are high consequence events, because they are they are one of the most highly uh, visible. Uh, you know, or emotion causing forms of uh, ocean pollution because the images are available everywhere. And if you see from 60s, 70s, 80s, even today, whenever, uh, you know, oil spill or, you know, incidents like these have occurred, uh, you know, it's sort of, you know, the images of black, gooey oil, washing ashore, oil wildlife, workers struggling to clean up, the, you know, small fractions of oil is sort of everywhere. And uh, they've sort of they're known to have caused crippling effects on local fishing industries, tourism, as well as the aesthetic beauty of the coastal areas. Despite that, hardly any attention was has been paid, you know, before 60s with regard to altering energy policies. And however, few legislations were put in place, and 
1899 Rivers and Harbors Appropriation Act was one of the, uh, you know, the initial ones. The act went into the fine, but yet proving the case for the Fed, for the government was difficult about uh, who was the guilty party. Then, uh, Oil Pollution Act of 1924 was passed. Again, it was, you know, uh, sort of an improvement, provided civil and criminal uh, penalties against discharges of oil, yet limitations involving liability sort of prevailed. Uh, then again, till 1960s, hardly any focus uh, was there on controlling pollution, on building mass transit, uh, you know, or fuel efficiency, or something like, things like that. Concern remained largely fo it focused largely on national security, and again, because of national security, then expansion of uh, energy production. However, so this is the image of uh, the Santa Barbara oil uh, spill, uh, which uh, you know blew out, which sort of took place in which took place in 1969, and it was then when oil spill, uh, actually oil pollution, oil spill as an ocean pollution, uh, was you know came as uh, was put on national uh, agenda, and th that was the time uh, about three million gallons of crude oil uh, spewed and the world could see images of oil soaked birds, ocean covered with black sheen and everything. And that was the time when, uh, you know, state politicians, both Democrats and Republicans, they started demanding drilling, you know, some action. So drilling moratoria was one of the things. Uh, the, you know, it was, it was, it is considered the birth of modern day environmental movement, the entire incident. And uh, it led to a uh, founding of GOO, the Get Oil Out movement, which was a reflection of the discontentment with oil industry and the local uh, development pressures. Now this growing anger, so again, so this is one of the news clips where Nixon promises to consider a permanent ban on drilling. Now it never happened, but there were debates happening in this on this front. Uh, but also, well, because 1969 has happened, after that there were a series of new legislations that were and rulings that were uh, sort of, you know, that happened. So 1970 we see a Water Quality Improvement Act, 1972 we see a Federal Water Pollution Control Act uh, Amendment, 1972 Ports and Water Waste Safety Act. Several other laws were passed which basically encouraged mass transit, curbed allowances given to the oil industry. And uh, these uh, played a major role in curtailing spills in sort of trimming waste, you know, the first technology improvement, imposed fines on industry, etc. Yet, the basic dependency on oil could not be altered. And uh, one of the main, um, you know, failures of all these legislations was that they failed to establish a preventive and an immediate response mechanism. You know, which could sort of prevent fill, uh, prevent spills altogether, or provide a prompt response. Uh, now, while this was happening, 1973, uh, you know, Arab oil embargo uh, you know, sort of took place, and Arab countries, wherein Arab countries refused to sell oil to the U.S., the, it was just a five-month embargo, but uh, it sort of it showed American vulnerability to foreign oil, and energy uh, again became a top uh, top priority in the wake of embargo. In 1970, President Jimmy Carter proposed a new energy plan, uh, an alternate energy plan to reduce growth of U.S. energy demands and cut costs. He also encouraged promotion of alternate, uh, you know, uh, energy sources like coal and other unconventional energy sources. He spoke about removal of control on oil prices and everything, but his energy policy got stalled in the con Congress, and nothing could happen after that. Uh, again, you know, you see 1975 to 1976, the spills continued to take place because there was no, not really, you know, not much change in the policy. So there were uh, about 10,000 spill incidents uh, took place within a year, in, you know, in a year's time between 1975 and 76, which uh, led to 27 to 40 million gallon of oil being spilled. Uh, between 1980 to 86, again, 80 million to 91 million uh, gallons of oil spilled. All of this created a sense of crisis, but you know it was still considered an anomaly in safety-conscious industries. And focus remained on men, uh, you know maintaining energy uh, needs. Spills were still considered used to energy, uh, you know, uh, to industries' advantages. The entire time, environmental groups and individuals were sort of left with no uh, window to which to affect to, to affect policy change. And issues uh, continued to remain uh, bottled up within the confines of an industry, uh, you know, 
of an industry friendly alliance which consisted of oil companies, shippers, insurance carriers, financiers, select congressional committees and interior departments. The, the most striking policy failure uh, was made apparent only, uh, you know, during after the 1989 Axel Valdez uh, spill, uh, wherein which was caused by the grounding of single hull vessel. Since the time is now, I'm not going into the entire thing, but uh, it uh, sort of caused death of more than 200. It was a completely human-induced disaster, and it caused a death of more than 250,000 birds. 2,800 sea otters, you know, 300 harbor eagles, two dozen whales, and everything. It still continues to, you know, uh, uh, affect wildlife population even today. And the uh, the the uh, it, it caused Alaskan fisheries and you know seafood processors faced major economic problems in 1989. They were closed for a considerable period of time. Owners were not retained by the Axon to skim oil. Faced bankruptcy. Uh, you know, indigenous people who subsist on wildlife continue continue to suffer health problems even today, uh, as uh, the chemical bio accumulated up the food chain. Uh, one of the critical factors here, you know, that transformed Axon Valdez from something from a manageable disaster to a catastrophe was its non-preparedness. Long time elapsed between tankers grounding and you know arrival of oil containment cleanup equipment. Once it arrived, which was about 36 hours late. Uh, you know, there were disagreements over responsibilities among several myriad, uh, you know, government agencies and private salvage firms. They added to further chaos and, you know, to the entire cleanup efforts. This, the spill also brought out differences in the state and federal relationships and made public the alliance that, you know, between the government and the industry, which wasn't very uh, clean. Now, Axon had supposedly contributed handsomely during the 1988 presidential election. Now, this, all of this led to the need, you know, that the, there was a need felt for a new legislation to reduce the number and volume of oil spills and minimize the damage to natural resources. And that is when uh, OPA 90, uh, Oil Pollution Act 90 was passed. And uh, uh, again, this is one of the images of uh, the Axon Valdez. This is the, the entire oil that was uh, spewed and you know how black and everything the entire ocean was covered with. Now, Oil Pollution Act uh, you know, provided for tougher penalties and liability for oil spillers. It increased the role of federal government. Uh, you know, uh, it was considered when it was passed, it was considered to be a futuristic act which was bound to take years to implement. Government, several government agencies like you know, Environmental uh, Protection Agency, EPA, uh, United States Coast Guard, Department of Transport, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, Office of Response and Restoration and Mineral, you know, Mineral Management Service, all were rendered responsible for implementing over 50 new administrative duties and responsibilities. Now, many of these new duties and responsibilities also uh, tend to fall in the bureaucratic uh, trap with not having enough manpower to introduce and implement these changes. However, OP90 uh, was, you know, a very, very. Uh, uh, it, it was a, it was a break from the past. It led to establishment of citizen, citizens' uh, advisory council uh, for Cook Inlet and Prince Williams, and uh, it was basically these councils were established uh, to provide an innovative check on the relationship between the government and the industry in Alaska, and it, it sought to bring the citizens into the decision-making process. So the councils, these councils had representatives from fishing industry organizations, from aquaculture organizations, from Alaska native organizations, environmental organizations, recreational organizations, Alaska state chambers of commerce, and nearby municipalities. So that way, it was uh, the OPA Act in itself was, uh, you know, was a break from the past, as I've mentioned before. Uh, however, it still did not resolve all the problems. It was highly successful, but still did not resolve all the problems. Controversy uh, swirled around the role of, you know, on, on issues such as spill liability, on the role of uh, citizen advisory committees, available of rapid response, oil spill, uh, oil spill uh, cleanup contractors, and all these things. And uh, these issues continued to po pose complications and vulnerabilities long after the enactment of law. Now, OP-19 chiefly targeted oil spills emanating from oil conveying uh, water freight more than it did oil spills caused by oil drilling platforms. And it's considered that, you know, had the Coast Guard system of oversight, inspection, and enforcement 
along with emergency management. If it would have been applied to drilling, platform, drilling platforms as it was to water freight and oil tankers, probably uh, the, the recent disaster, the, the, the disaster that occurred in 2010, BPN Transocean probably would not have taken the risks that uh, they reported needed. Just a minute. So, uh, yeah, so now I'll uh, come to the 2010 Gulf of Mexico oil spill. Again, uh, it was a drilling platform explosion, and again, it revealed the inadequate conditions of the U.S. coastal disaster mitigation and preparedness. It uh, almost killed 11 crew members, forced 115 others to abandon the ship. Uh, over the next three months, it continued to uh, you know, spew uh, oil, and 4.9 billion barrels of oil was spewed. Affected tourism, uh, the spill again brought to picture new issues of scale, technology, uh, responsibility, despite all the legal requirements that were, you know, that were in place. Uh, this is one of the pictures. Now, number of things if we see uh, in, uh, you know, for for something like uh, BP for the, uh, you know, the McDonald's spill to happen. A number of things had to go wrong. A concrete plug had to fail. Uh, Pre-plugging pressure had to be misinterpreted. Early signs that the blowout was brewing was to be missed. Response plans prepared by MMS and industry was, you know, had to be inadequate and everything. So all of this basically, uh, you know, puts in the picture that it was the policy to run the risks that led to blowout. And even though a number of accidents before, you know, the smaller accidents or complaints were, uh, you know, continued to come into picture, but they weren't register, you know, they weren't really taken into consideration, and they did not change the risk-taking behavior of the industry. Again, but one of the major reasons was the hunger of oil that I've been talking about, and gas and revenue generation, as well as local employment uh, opportunities. All of this uh, led to the entire drill baby drill approach, which uh, you know which sort of stated that the only important thing that the nation needs is to fulfill uh, energy needs and everything. So uh, again, the role of MMS uh, came into a lot of uh, criticism. Uh, it was, it was uh, criticized for management shortcomings, ethical lapses uh, among personnel, conflicts of interest. Uh, MMS employees uh, have been known for taking sort of sexual uh, favors, substance abuse, and more than a dozen employees, including the former director, uh, you know, took meals and, you know, there were reports that he, uh, you know, took meals and ski trips and spawn tickets and all these things. And uh, again, MMS response plans also was uh, criticized. It was a very cut and paste plan and everything. Okay, so I'll just sort of try and wrap it up. It uh, did not have any policy for oil drilling and uh, now, after the spill, while the federal government ordered uh, several uh, uh, changes, like moratorium on uh, offshore drilling, uh, reorganization of MMS into, you know, uh, uh, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and Regulation and Enforcement, Bureau of Safety, uh, and Environmental Enforcement, inspectors were added to improve oversight, new safety rules uh, to improve well design and integrity, and periodic audits and everything. But the Gulf still it continues to struggle because <coughs> disaster. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. 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 Yeah, so just wrapping up. One minute. Yeah. So government agencies were not able to uh, place tougher rules on design and operation preventers. No steps have been taken to put culture, uh, you know, to create a culture that puts safety first. Congress has failed, uh, you know, it has been criticized a lot. Congress has failed in adopting major laws on oil and gas drilling, despite introducing more than 150 bills, you know, holding more than 60 hearings. It only passed Restore Act, under which, you know, 80% of the fine that BP pays would go to uh, environment and economic reconstruction project. The current liability cap is considered inadequate. Uh, you know, cap and trade bill has died without a uh, vote. Presidential moratorium, uh, on the new drilling, you know, has been lifted. Oil spill has completely vanished from media attention. Arctic Ocean has been opened again for drilling of uh, shell oil. And all of this has been because the notion of energy independence legacy, it still believes that the risks can be ignored or easily managed. And again, like the disasters in the past and the Macondo well disaster had, uh, has, demo you know, have demonstrated, 
this sort of position is very, very irresponsible because creating or reorganizing uh, institutions as they've done with in the case of MMS is not the only answer to sort of create a responsible energy policy. Change is possible only if stakeholders and policymakers are committed. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Of whether a 
proposed policy or uh, or something uh, furthers equality, or is the procedure by which you arrive to this policy is the procedure democratic? Uh, if you refer to the market good, uh, you ask how much does it cost, or what are the financial benefits? Uh, then there are other goods like technological progress, ecological good, this kind of arguments come up. And so we took a sample of uh, newspaper reporting on the UN uh, COPs uh, from Kyoto 1997 to Durban 2011 in New York Times and Le Monde. Got about 600 newspaper articles uh, and did a uh, qualitative, quantitative content analysis of, of what's going on there. Um, just one look at the quantitative differences. Uh, so we have France in red and US in, in blue, and you can see civic arguments referring to equality uh, and democracy are somewhat more common in, in France. Uh, market arguments are more common in, in the United States. Uh, and by, by all in all, actually, uh, I, I was surprised to find that they come so close to each other. I, I would have expected to find uh, larger differences, but these are these differences are pretty much in line with earlier studies on the culture of political culture and the culture of public debate in, in these countries. So you can see you can see sort of the city of French and the, the market argumentation in the U.S. But I uh, became more interested in the similarities and in the fact that they actually seem to be some kind of convergence from 1997 to. 2011, uh, and uh, so the situation in 1997 uh, was a bit like this. Uh, in this field, there's the value of ecology uh, and and the belief of whether furthering the value of ecology is compatible. Uh, with market benefits. So, so there was a stronger division uh, in our material in 1997 with, with the people who argued for the ecology essentially to be first priority, even if it costs a lot of money. They were saying, no, we can't have both. We can't have economy and ecology, or economic good and, and, and ecological good, and we have to opt for the ecological. And so you would find statements like this. Uh, the ecological crisis is a consequence of the fact that capitalism needs unlimited growth. And then people arguing that, that we need to opt for either growth or, uh, or the ecology. Or in the US especially, after the Kyoto negotiations, there was a big wave of, uh, it was the Clinton administration negotiating the deal and, and, and there was a big wave of Republican opposition saying things like this falling into the square uh, there. Well, I, I don't say economists, they're not economists, but they're economists in the sense that they want to know economy first. Uh, protecting our environment is an honorable goal, Representative Bill Paxson, a fast-rising Republican star from New York said. But we must ask ourselves an equally important question. Can we afford to destroy our children's economic future in the process? So this was the kind of argument you would get. The economy, ecology, very much opposed. Uh, and I'm not saying this is the mainstream or this is the all, all the argumentation was like this, but you could see a clear, clear separation. And but when you go towards the Copenhagen COP in, in 2009, which was a big, big event in the media debate on climate change, as you all have noticed, if you were reading the newspapers and on there, on from there to 2011, you started to see much more people arguing in this square right here, saying, yes, we are for ecology, but we, we're holding the, uh, we, we're for the value of ecology, but we're holding the belief that you can have both uh, ecology and, and market good. So the sort of eco eco ecological modernization kind of argument. Uh, so you would get arguments like this. This is from uh, 2009 reporting in the New York Times. Uh, a quote from what Obama was saying at the time. 
He says, we're going to be the guys who are producing wind turbines, and we're going to be the folks who are producing solar panels on rooftops. It produces jobs that can be exported. It reduces our dependence <coughs> on foreign oil. Um, it's good economics. It will increase our exports. Oh, and by the way, it also solves the climate crisis. So this is the tone uh, in, in 2011. <coughs> 2011. Um, and so, to cut it very brief, uh, the conclusion from, from, from this analysis is that yes, you can see differences in national political cultures, and I think these differences have an effect on how global political problems are debated in different countries, which in turn might have effects on, on the global negotiations. But what we see here in the case, case of climate change, that these differences are actually, uh, actually there is some kind of convergence. Uh, so ecological and market justifications or frames are increasingly seen as compatible in both countries, US and France. So at least rhetorically, uh, ecological modernization is winning. But then, of course, there remains the question of whether this is good or bad for the climate. Uh, because you can say, yeah, they're okay, fine, now we're agreeing, so maybe we're closer to a deal, and maybe actually we can have both of the good things. Uh, but then again, there's quite a bit of empirical evidence saying the more growth of GDP, the more growth of CO2. Uh, and, and we're kind of still waiting for ecological modernization to happen. As we saw from Dieter's presentation today, not referring to CO2, but to material flows generally you could see that it was going down, the amount of material that you use to produce a dollar of GDP, but then it started going up again. And I think that's a change in global consumption patterns and, and, and things. So, so that's, that, that's, of course, another, another research question. But that's, so, so with that, that note, whether this convergence that we observe is good for bad or the climate model, I would be with that. Thank you. I have a question. Like, so what are the practical implications of, of this conclusion? As you know, the Bangladesh is the most vulnerable country in, uh, to climate change in terms. And uh, the expert says that uh, the coastal area of the country is go on the sea of uh, uh, if the global warming continues. However, uh, the, with the economic and uh, industrial development, the environment of Bangladesh is generally fast and it's hampering the country's economic, social, and cultural, and human complex. Uh, and the, as a result, you know, the capital of Bangladesh, Dhaka, is, the, is listed uh, as a most livable city in the whole world. However, um, uh, it is happening that uh, a group of people have already uh, raising their voice against the amount of pollution. Uh, then they also uh, uh, organized a number of movements across the cities in the country to protect the environment. And, uh, uh, and it, uh, in, in, the, in this movement, uh, they uh, uh, with the, uh, another media, they also use the social network size in the age of information age. And uh, okay, uh, now we can uh, say that uh, what is the same social network size? Social network size can simply, uh, simply be defined as an interactive internet-based platform where anybody can share his or her ideas, thoughts, opinions, feelings, analysis, etc., to the wider world easily. And you know, uh, uh, through the social networking sites, you can um, engage in discussion or debate uh, through, uh, uh, and uh, by this way, you can uh, generate a new idea uh, or uh, you can. Uh, mm, Reconstruct your old ideas. Lauren moves that interactive media provide channels for social movements 
to take digital com content from supporters and from other sources which can then be juxtaposed, recontextualized, and uh, distributed. Uh, through the social media, you know, in the traditional communication pattern has been changed. Now you can communicate in two directional ways. Uh, in, in, the, in the traditional uh, uh, movement, uh, only organizers can communicate with the supporters. They can uh, circulate information to the supporters. But in the information age, through the social media, supporters also can communicate with the sub another supporters and also with the uh, organizers. They also can publish the movement materials easily through the social media. Now you can see the um, what is the scenario of the social network sites in Bangladesh? The number of internet users uh, was more than 30.66 million in October 2013 in the country. Uh, what, is the, what is the total number of population in Bangladesh is 160.66 uh, uh, million. And in August 2013, the number of Facebook users was 5.4 million. And uh, there are more than 60 community blog, blog sites and around 250,000 bloggers in the country. Uh, as you see, the 52% of the Facebook users of the country are 18 to 24 years old, and 27 of the percent of the users are 25 to 34 years old. Uh, it's shown that the most of the social media users of the country are young, and you know the uh, the movement was uh, is, is usually organized by the uh, young people. And uh, as like as other parts uh, of the world, Bangladesh uh, social media users also uh, use this uh, new media uh, as a platform to build the community and organize movements of different issues. And, the, uh, and uh, also in their environmental issues. And, uh, and they also use this uh, social uh, network sites as a media of citizen journalism. They regularly write uh, on their issues. Uh, and uh, there are several uh, examples that the uh, government also takes initiative to resolve these issues after what we discuss in the social media. There is an example uh, that uh, I um, uh, mentioned at the start of protest. This is, uh, this is a, rec a recent protest uh, which was organized in, uh, in Bangladesh. It is about uh, uh, demanding the trial of war criminals, and uh, it is uh, mainly organized by some bloggers and online activists. They have been uh, invited people for the social media to the join with them. And uh, up to a few days, thousands of people joined with them in the Dhaka. And later it spread it uh, over, uh, across the world, and also across uh, other cities in Bangladesh. And uh, I, I will um, uh, tell about the Rampal movement later. And this is because this is my case study and the development movement. OK, uh, here is the, uh, a brief history I've written. Uh, as, uh, uh, we can say, in a sense, you can say that uh, the efforts to protect the environment in the Bangladesh uh, is not new. It's not new. There was a harmonious coexistence between nature and people before the industri industrialization. And uh, you know, there's the uh, the people of the country uh, in, in before the transition basically uh, depended, depended on the agriculture and uh, they usually, their uh, economic activities actually was not harmful for the uh, uh, nature and in this way they, they, they saved the environment and we can say that uh, it, they uh, they disturbed the nature after before the 
industrialization. But in the 80s, urban air, water, and sound pollution was the reason. Uh, forest wildlands open, uh, space began to disappear. And during this period, government and also the people, non government organizations, uh, took initiative to protect the environment. And then, and, and, and this trend is, uh, is, is going now also. Different environmental issues uh, have been, I would call that you know, it should have been discussed on the social network of science, regularly by government the activists, activists, and concerned citizens are building virtual networks by opening a Facebook group, several of them extend their efforts on the ground data. There is an example that uh, a, 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 a group named Rewind People, they first uh, uh, created a group on the Facebook uh, where many developing people joined. Later they decided to take some, uh, to do some work on the ground and uh, they have uh, created an independent organization. And they are uh, doing research, uh, campaigning activities on Rewind issues. Okay, uh, I took this uh, took the recent um, Rampal Power Print uh, project movement uh, to which was uh, to the purpose to uh, uh, this is the purpose uh, you can see the 120 megawatt coal fired power plant at Rampal Gujila in Bagar, the southern part of Bangladesh. And it is uh, only 40 kilometers north of the world's largest mangrove forest, uh, Sundarbans. Environmentalist says that this is the uh, uh, image of the proposed plan. Environmentalist uh, demanding to cancel the project, arguing that the plan is not merely yeah. dangerous for the Sundarbans. Ecology, but also forces state to local livelihoods because about 2.5 million people depend on the forest. They earn their livelihoods on cutting woods, fishing, and, uh, uh, and uh, they're collecting honey from this forest. And they, environmentalists, are saying that if the plan will be the forest will be destroyed. This is an uh, image uh, which was uh, for the, which was made by the forester. Uh, and this is a knee plate forester. Maybe. So that uh, a huge uh, long march was organized by the protesters on uh, September. Uh, 24 to 28 uh, last year. Thousands of people joined in the long march uh, and it was about, about four, uh, 400 kilometers long. And so it is from the capital city Dhaka to the Sundarbans. And uh, social networking sites were widely used to organize this uh, long march. Uh, protesters uh, created many Facebook pages, groups, uh, to oppose the plan, and most of the uh, also most of the blog sites are also flooded with uh, posts opposing the plan, and uh, many general people, as, long, uh, as well as the politi political party members, uh, activists, many general people also joined the program, and they said that uh, they can uh, they joined the program by. Uh, uh, by motivating uh, through the uh, message of the protesters, which was articulated by social network sites. <coughs> okay, uh, I I try to um, analyze the uh, protest uh, based on the new social movement theory, and you know the one of the main characteristics of the. New social movement uh, is the, the, it is organized on moral issue rather than uh, direct interest of any uh, uh, particular social groups. 
and uh, as I found that uh, uh, the uh, participants of the movement join the uh, movement as the thing it is uh, it is a it is a moral issue to join the movement. The, the, and they uh, also discussed it in on their Facebook post, blog post, and also on the internet talk with the media reporters. They said that Sundarban has been a safeguard against frequent cyclones, storm, and other natural disasters. It is not only balancing the local ecosystem, but also its unique in biological diversity and wildlife resources, including renowned Bengal tiger. More than 60% of the country's total reserve forest is covered by the forest, which contributes about 50% of total forest revenue. And that's why they think that uh, they should join the protest and they uh, express their uh, stance against the power plant in a sentence that there are many alternative ways to power generation, but there is no alternative for sugar bonds. Okay, uh, another uh, uh, important characteristic of the new social movement is that uh, the movement uh, is organized in informal rules and um, flexible ways, avoiding hierarchy, uh, bureaucracy, and uh, qualifications of membership. And uh, the participants of the movement said that uh, it, 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 this is uh, something like that. The movement it was led by a national committee, which is a common platform for environmentalists, political parties, and also the activists. Anybody can join uh, on the platform. And every decision regarding movement policy is taken by a core committee. Okay. Uh, composed uh, by a convener, a member secretary, and representatives of all political parties who join the movement, environmentalists, and other non-political uh, uh, people. And uh, as they said, that due to the flexibility and non-political character, uh, political party members as well as general people join the movement. Uh, as, as I have so said already, the social network is such a point used in the, in the movement. And uh, the activists uh, uh, told that as uh, yes, traditional media do not cover most of their events, the activists share information related to the movement on social media, especially on Facebook. They told, told me that uh, they have uh, organized many events uh, and, uh, and they invited journalists, but most of the time the journalists did not cover their events. Because they, uh, as they say, that, uh, because that, uh, they don't think that uh, it has a market value. That's why they, they did not publish the reports of the media, and that's why they publish their movement related information on the social networking sites. And, uh, and they, they said that they, it has a good, it was a, it has a good impact because many people joined them. Uh, and uh, they also said that due to the interactive characteristics, social networking such users can acquire a sense of belonging to an emerging environmental community. And uh, you know, many uh, Bangladeshi people lived in abroad. And uh, they can also uh, join uh, in the movement virtually. And uh, social networking sites motivated many non partisan people who often avoid political programs to join the program. Uh, you know, in Bangladesh, most of the people are uh, avoiding politics because they think that uh, politics is not doing any good for them. And uh, that is why the uh, political parties uh, have to struggle to uh, attract people. But in, that, in this case, uh, many non-partisan people also join because uh, uh, because of uh, as, as like as, as like as they said that uh, it was uh, happened due to the social networking sites and uh, uh, due to its 
non partitional character. Okay, and finally, I, I want to say that uh, what I uh, found in this study is that uh, as the mainstream media, mainstream corporate media don't seriously cover the events of uh, environmental movement, uh, activists use the social networking sites and uh, through traditional communication tools are still important to organize a successful movement. The rampal movement indicates that social networking sites can also attract non-partisan people to join social movements in Bangladesh. And new communication patterns used by the activists determine the new characteristics of the social movements and help it to be different from conventional movements. I uh, actually argue what to do there. The, the, uh, it is an example of new social movement because the new uh, communication, the communication pattern of the traditional media has been changed due to the new communication technology. As uh, anybody can join in the movement and anybody can uh, share their views and also the uh, movement materials with the other easily. And, 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 and it, is, it, it has changed the uh, uh, conventional relationship between supporters and the organizers. The traditional uh, concept has been changed due to the social network research, and that is why uh, the Rampal movement and any, uh, some other movements of, the, of Bangladesh uh, in, as, uh, as an example of new social movement. I want to say. Thank you very much. This kind of illustrates what, I, what, what we are planning to talk about. Uh, we will talk about basically university community partnership for social action research, a network which is six years old, more or less. This is one of the major projects uh, resulting from done, done by this network over the last two, three years, and it's, it still will be continuing for the, another couple of years. And this is the, the latest initiative which kind of resulted from, from this project. So this, all these three things are connected together. And could you just go to the other side? And so basically, I am from Arizona State University. And uh, there is a global institute of sustainability there that has like, a strong ambitions to concentrate on, uh, on ideas of sustainability for the next 10 years. And I also, with a group of my colleagues from Canada, Australia, and Poland, we created uh, in, in some years ago in 19 in 2008, this, this network. And Rudip is uh, from a student from uh, Kathmandu, and he is a member of ICT team in Nepal. And whenever we have any kind of presentation about the network at conference, international conference, we always try to bring one of the students who are on the leadership team just to expose them to, to you know, the international environment and, and also give an opportunity to share what, what they do uh, on, on, on their side. Okay, so why are we coming with him? You, I, I think you know about Millennium Development Goals, yes, everybody knows. And everybody knows that, that in 2015, there is a deadline for Millennium Development Goals. And United Nations and all international organizations now are thinking, what's next? And they are trying to evaluate also what we have accomplished so far uh, through this you know, 14 years of, of, of work. And well, yes, a lot has been done, but uh, also not everything has been done. If you only look at the goal eradicating poverty, we have more poor people in the world today than we had in, two, in the year 2000 when we started to think about building the development goal for a whole variety of reasons. So in 2012, the United Nations uh, organized uh, uh, a congress uh, in Rio de Janeiro on sustainability and uh, one of the tasks uh, was given to a group of people who were, who were uh, called the, the Global Panel of Prominent Persons. Uh, presidents of the countries, very rich people, the Queen of, I uh, of Iran, and this type of people. And their task was to say, what, what will we do after 2015? And basically, this is what they said, what was the result of this, 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 uh, this panel. We, the main goal will be eradicating poverty. We just have to concentrate all our efforts on the issue of poverty. And how can we do it? 
we have to, we, we should leave no one behind. We should concentrate on sustainability issues. We should create new jobs and economies for growth. And finally, build peace and justice and, and institutions, organizations that will really work for people and will be accountable. And all together, all these, all these areas should be kind of supported by something what they call global partnership for sustainability. That's, that's, the, that's the main idea. What is global partnership for sustainability? It means that it's global, global. Everybody is supposed to collaborate with everybody. But, uh, you know, it's impossible to make suddenly everybody to collaborate with everybody. So we started to think, you know, maybe there would be a sense to create first some sort of a model of this collaboration and to show how, how should it work? How can we make it? How can we connect together university, community organizations, corporate business and government working together towards these goals? So the whole idea of university community partnership for social action research was born at the first international conference on community psychology in Puerto Rico in 2007. It was the first time community psychologists from all around the world came together to talk what, who we are, what we should do. And uh, there were two questions which were prevailing in all discussions over and over again. The first one was, what is the really impact of uh, social economic system and of cultural context on our understanding of key community related concepts? In other words, could you go to the next slide? If you, if you look at, uh, you, no, no, you just went the wrong direction. You just went back. You, you go forward. Okay, so if you look at some of these examples of, the, of, of this concept here, social justice, economic prosperity, sense of community, does mean the same in Africa, in, for example, Cameroon, in, in India, and in Mesa, Arizona? Or people have totally different connotations and denotations of what does it really mean to social justice, equality, or clean environment? And, and definitely there are different standards. So we somehow decided that well, we, we need to kind of learn from each other. Could you go back to the previous one? No? And, to, and we need to kind of together answer this question. What is the impact of culture, cultural context, and social economic context on effectiveness and organizational community process, community programs? Because if we don't know it, well, we, we will be not able to work with people with different cultures. Why is it important? Well, you are from the United States, yes? No. Where are you from? I'm working on the United States. Oh, okay. Oh, you're working in the United States. So you, you know that if you go to California, to a small, a small town, you will find people from Bangladesh, from India, from China, from, 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 from all over the world. And now, try to imagine that you are a community leader, that you are a member of the government, and you have to organize all these people to work towards something. Unless you really understand their cultural background, their values, their, 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 their experience, there is no way you will communicate with them. And there is no way you will, you will bring them together to work together. So it seems to be extremely important to educate future community leaders on this impact. So they will have some basic understanding of cultural diversity, of, of the impact of culture on, 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 on people's behavior, and so on. So we decided after coming back to the uh, next one uh, that uh, we, we just need to somehow do something about this. And that we need to create on the internet some kind of a website where uh, students, university faculty, community activists, and community organizations could just talk to each other. And, and that's, that's what we did. And it's kind of a funny story altogether because when, when I came back from this conference, I, we organized a meeting, we invited a couple of experts, we presented them the idea, and after two hours of discussion, they told us, you know what, without half a million dollars and, uh, and a group of experts, don't even try. That's, that's too, too big task, you know, that's, 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 that it would not work. So I don't need to tell you that we were disappointed and that uh, we, we thought, okay, let's forget about the idea. And there was a girl, little girl from China, who said, you know what, I know how to make a website. Just let me try to do a small website. Everybody started laughing, you know. They are talking about half a million dollar a group of experts, and this little girl wants to do a website. But she was kind of persistent, insisting, insisting, and so we, we, we let's try. And she did a website, then 
it's, it's kind of started to expand, and then suddenly someone from Canada, from the Center for International Governance Innovations, the, there was an institution created by uh, the Canadian government, uh, by the, from the money given by the guy who invented Blackberry. He just gave 20 million dollars, Canadian government gave another 20, and they created this organization to connect people interested in, go in governance. And they, they said, well, let, we will help you to develop a technologically sound website, and we can, we can host it, and we will help you. So we agreed, we moved from ASU uh, server, and they created basically the technological uh, the, the website, which is have the same technology as Facebook practically, the same, the same uh, uh, features and, 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 and uh, interactive features and so on. So could you go next? So in our, initially, <coughs> our mission was simply to educate community leaders, prepare them to address millennium development, millennium development goals. That's what, that was our, our, our purpose. But then we slowly, slowly started to modify this, this mission. And so the, fir the first element was that we wanted to create this cross-cultural dialogue, allow people to, to talk to blogs, uh, uh, forums, and so on. Then the other one was to promote community engaged research. Research which are done not in the laboratory at the university, but at the community, together with the community. Then we wanted to inspire partnership between university, community organization, government, and our corporate business and uh, in, in, in different countries. And, and again, to educate a new generation of community, community leaders who will continue the mission of Millennium Development Goals after you know the deadline after 2015, and this mission is still kind of evolving. Okay, what are the major milestones of the network? There was this partnership with the center, then official launch in 2008 in Canada, and then we started collaboration with United Nations Foundation and United Nations Millennium Campaign. Uh, they gave us a lot of support and directions and connections and so on. And then we started to do different projects. That was one of the very first projects. We started to build a Gandhi College of Social Work in uh, Champaran in Bihar. Uh, those of you who are from here, you know that this is the place where Gandhi started his movement many, many years ago. And uh, so there is still uh, like a little shrine there. And uh, so Birendra Kumar, who is our coordinator for, for, for India, he just said, well, let's go there, you know, he was from Bihar, let's, let's try. And we went to this uh, Cham to Champaran to meet with community leaders. And I have to tell you that was another experience. I had the feeling that I was talking to the Godfather. Have you seen the movie Godfather? Mm -hmm. Yes. There was a gentleman, 70 something years old, his four sons and uh, like six or seven grandsons. And so they were sitting like around uh, on the chairs and uh, they said, so, so well, what can we do for you? So we were talking for three hours and they had like stone faces, no reaction at all. And we were already absolutely sure nothing would come out of this. And suddenly the man smiled and he said, let's go to have lunch, let's do it. <laughs> and, and that's how it started. They gave us uh, land, they gave us buildings, they gave us a lot of support, connection with the government and the project started. And this is just, you know, the first meeting in the, in the, in the college, this is Virendra Kumar, where these poor, poor people from Bihar area who never ever had a chance to express opinion on anything. No one ever asked them, you know, about their opinion. They suddenly were invited there, they had the voice, they could talk, they could uh, do, they, they, they suddenly started to be empowered. And we are still working on this project. Okay, then, that was something similar, you know, it was not 400 miles, 400 kilometers, but I think 200 kilometers. Uh, they organized this social justice walk. Uh, the whole group of act Gandhi activists and, uh, uh, and people from this college, the Gandhi College of Social Work, we were marching from village to village and talking to villagers about sanitation, agribusiness, social justice, uh, women empowerment, and uh, that was absolutely amazing experience. They cannot consider the fact that I am an old man and they, they, they drove me by car 
from 18 kilometers, and I, I had to work out, walk all the way on the last two kilometers. But so that was that was a good good idea. But it was for me, it was an absolutely amazing experience to to now go from village to village to see passion and involvement of all these people, and also to to see how responsive was was all these people, how they wanted to have change, how they wanted to improve things. Okay, let's go next. The other project is China. That was uh, at SIAS International University in Jinzhou. Uh, we started to create something what was called the World Academy for the Future of Women. Uh, we selected 100 girls from the group of about 20,000 students. Girls who had ambitions to become leaders on the local level or international level. And then we brought successful women from the United States successful in business, education, art. And through one year, they were teaching these girls what are, how to become successful, how to become a, a woman, a female leader. And after two years, they, they added also men to this academy. So now also men graduate from this academy. And uh, now we are trying to move it also to some other countries. That was also a very powerful project, bridging the world. We, we did it in China. Uh, I think we did three or four workshops like this. We invited community leaders from uh, about 15 countries, Africa, South America, and so on. Three more minutes. Three more minutes on it. Okay. Oh, I, I, I was looking at the watch. I was thinking that I have time till 4.15. Uh, OK. So you can have four. <laughs> four, okay. four, four in discussion. <laughs> OK. Uh, so can we skip discussion? Can we skip discussion? We can, you can because, more, because then I will have a couple more minutes and I have some flyers here and then we get, will be available for talking to have, who is interested in, in, in anything. Okay, let's just do it this way. So anyway, and there was like 2,000 students listening to these community leaders talking about, uh, about their experiences. And again, in China, I don't know whether you know, the concept of volunteerism, volunteerism is not existing at all. So this young student from China was listening to 20 years old activists from, from uh, Nigeria uh, hearing of, about her work with AIDS. And, and they, they just couldn't believe that someone 20 years old can, can do so many things. And you know, next week after the, the Bridging the World, they organized the, the educational club for about AIDS and so on. OK, let's go further. Then we organized several so-called Stand Up Against Poverty events in China, Cameroon, Gambia, India, USA, and, and, and in India here. In China, about 20,000 students, they made declaration that they will do something to eradicate poverty in the world. Go next. And then we started to develop partnership with different organizations, just to get some sort of support. Uh, certain from International Governance Innovation, I already mentioned about them, I've mentioned about this, African Union. They started to sponsor us. I will say a couple of words about this in a moment. Global Youth Innovation Network, World Youth Alliance. Go to it next. <coughs> This was the conference organized by World Youth Alliance. It's an organization associated with the United Nations for young community leaders. The conclusion of the conference was we need to train community leaders and uh, teach them how to, how to do agribusiness and uh, how to really utilize agricultural resources. So we came back to America and we started to create the program. And, uh, and the program, when we had read the program, Virendra Kumar, this one from Gandhi College of Social Work, called me Dr. Mario, you have to come to see this place, Gandhi Research Foundation and Jane Irrigation System in Jalgao. Uh, I said, why? Well, I can't explain you, you just have to come. So I went there, and what I saw, it was just, anybody knows who is heard about Jane Irrigation System? It's a company that uh, is present in 120 countries. They have 70% of uh, irrigation uh, of market or irrigation market in Asia. They got many awards, including they were nominated by the World Economic Council as the cha World Champion of Sustainability. Absolutely amazing organization. And this for for you guys from India, you know when you drive from Aurang Aurangabad to to, to Jalgaon, you drive uh, three hours by car from the airport to headquarters, and there's one poor village, another poor village, another poor village, another poor village, and suddenly you are in a paradise. 
everything is clean, everything is recycled, everything is, uh, it's just, it's just, you can't believe that this is, this is the same country. You, you can't find a piece of paper, you know, anywhere at all. And so we decided that, well, instead of doing program in Africa, we'll bring people from Africa and show them what can be done that you can do in the country that has so many problems with waste management, with poverty, with so on. You can create organization and community which is powerful, empowered, producing food, secure, and, and so on. So that's when we came to the idea to organize a partnership between Arizona State University, the Gandhi Research Foundation, and Gene Irrigation. We had a couple of negotiations. They came to visit us in Arizona. Finally, we signed the agreement. and they, the, the main project for this agreement, for this partnership, is this. Empowerment for peace through leadership in agribusiness and sustainability. Please kind of think about the moment, about the, about the title. We, we've been working pretty hard on this. You know something about Gandhi, yes? You remember that one of his ideas was to develop the country economically and to develop a village. And, uh, and in 2004, United Nations uh, published the uh, sort of report on relationship between agribusiness and uh, peace. And the conclusion was exactly the same. If you want to maintain peace and stability in developing countries, you need to teach people how to utilize agricultural resources. When people have enough food, there is food security, they will not take guns and kill each other. So that's why we created this program. And can you go further? So we have once a year a leadership meeting uh, we invite uh, 25 to 50 community leaders from Africa, and we train them. And we show them even hands-on experience. Could we go further? That's the opening ceremony there. This is, this is Mr. Jane, who is the, the, the chairman of Jane Irrigation System. Go to the next one. Uh, this is the, they have absolutely amazing educational center, which is so modern that it could be you know, in the United Nations. They can accommodate up to 500 people at a time with, with hotel, with, with food, with, with, with everything. Go further. And so people who come there, they have field trips, they have teamwork, they, they analyze a model of community, they have individual coaching and mentoring, and so on. Here is the flyer. If you are interested in this, next workshop will be in, in October in Jargon. You may just figure out. Maybe you would be interested to come or send someone there. OK, that's the field trip there from the last workshop we had there, next one. I will skip this content. This is the group of uh, people from 2012. And go ahead. And then we may ask, what, what was the impact of all this? But did it bring any change at all? Yes, it did. We registered a couple of NGOs already in Africa, which are we have doing this, the same. We have uh, we organize a leadership training loca locally in, in Cameroon, and the other one is organized in Nigeria now. We signed the partnership agreement with Pokhara University, and together with the, with the irrigation system, we are working on global water university. That's his last idea of his life to create a global water university to teach people how to utilize water. And finally, we form NPS labs clubs in high schools, and maybe you. I'll give you a couple of words about it. How much? Five minutes more? Sure. Okay. So we had made some members in uh, Nepal and the first uh, is Pokhara University in Pokhara. We have made some members in there. And uh, the another one is uh, Ananda Tuni. School. This is a private school, and uh, we have gone in that school, and we have made some members there. The students were kind of really interested to make members in there, so we have made the members. And uh, another one is in India, Anupati High School. So I haven't been there in that school, so the well, Dr. Mike was told that. Just say a couple of words about this is the school. Yeah, this uh, is the school, but uh, it's on the headquarters yeah. of the irrigation system. They selected the best uh, students from all around the country. They have selected the best teachers, and they are trying to create leaders. You should meet these kids. This side, speaking perfect English, knowing everything about history and geography, and and asking you questions that, that you know 
myself with with PhD, I, I was not able to answer these questions. So that's uh, that uh, they they will also create such a problem. There. Okay. So beside this high school, so we we have also made uh, some members in SOS Nepal, SOS Children. So this is the organization uh, which takes care for the children who don't have the family and they are also not acceptable in the society. So we have gone and the SOS children is in Nepal gone. So we have gone there and we made some clubs in there too and they were kind of really interested and they were telling me to make an event for the blood donation group. So they were kind of really interested. So we will also be going there in Nepal guns to make that event. So so we are now in this tree, we are built from cloth in this tree school. So now we will make and the other clubs in hope in this university. So we, we if this experiment really will work, we will try to first organize communication between the schools and then exchange we will bring, like children to go, you know, from one country to another and 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 uh, to simply interact with each other. Can you say a couple of words? What kind of experience was it for you to, to work for this project all together? Oh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's kind of really interested me because uh, many students were uh, trying to contact me to uh, make their clubs. And we are, I'm also going in, uh, in another city of Nepal too because they were calling me to make their team club too. So we are going in Hidora and there are a lot of uh, city in Nepal. So we are going all to make them club for this English lab club. So we will provide the with the education for the leadership training for sustainable development. So, okay, but you, you really didn't answer my question. I was asking, what was the personal experience for you to work with the network and so on? Oh, I, it was, uh, I, I'm the great example of this global network, you know. So, so this is my first international conference, you know, because by this, by the help of this uh, UCP Charlotte, I, I'm also a um, undergraduate student, so I'm kind of a, uh, this is my first experience in this. So uh, it was very good, you know, it was very good to make a such uh, participant in this uh, project. So um, uh, it was really fun. Okay, all right. So the, the, the final impact was, as I mentioned, this. The, the group of participants of NPC Labs uh, workshops uh, from Nigeria, a couple of other African countries from India, they just decided to create uh, another website or inter internet hub where we can connect different organizations uh, focused on sustainability. And there will be a, ca a categorical system there when you can find a partner, you can find people with similar interests, you can find who, is, who needs volunteers, who needs money, and so on and so on. And uh, this is still under construction. We are starting this project relatively soon. If any one of you is interested or accepts some suggestions, who would like to go, please do it. Here I have a couple of flyers. I have the flyer about UCP Starnet. We have also the flyer about uh, some sort of a water project, and there is a flyer about MP Slab. So please uh, look at this. If you have any questions, you can find us uh, outside during the rest of the day. All right? Thank you, so thank you very Thanks. much. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thanks to all the presenters. Thanks for the.